Welcome to the Professional Website Investors Podcast, the show where we talk about what it takes to successfully buy, operate, scale, and sell a thriving e-commerce business. When it comes to doing business online, we believe that buying an existing website is far superior to building one from scratch. So if you're a career professional who's looking to become an e-commerce store owner, listening to this show will give you the knowledge, tools, and community support you need to be successful. We've got another great episode for you today, so without further ado, let's get into today's discussion, and I'll be back on the other side to tie up any loose ends. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. My name is James Sowers, and I am joined, as always, by Mr. Ian Bond. Ian, it looks beautiful at night in the background there, so maybe we'll have to make this quick because you uh, might be wrapping up your day, but it's always good to see you. Anything new on your end? Uh, James, what's new? You know, the, um, I could say what I said the last time, you know, it's my favorite time of the year. We have the holidays coming up. But there's a nice sprint to the end of the year where you get an opportunity to set yourself up for a strong beginning next year. So uh, I, I, I love it. Um, we also have some free time coming up at the end of the year, which is always, you know, always something to look forward to, family and, and stuff like that. But, you know, right now, there's just an enormous opportunity to get a lot done. Um, you know, maybe we're all other people are, you know, kind of slacking off. So I always, I, you know, always feel relatively... Uh, like I'm, you know, advantaged when when people, you know, when I'm up and working and it's, uh, you know, people are sleeping or, you know, it's dark inside their home. So right. I, I like that feeling. It's it's a good feeling. I kind of miss that from my days in the military where you get more done before 9 a.m. than most people get done all day. I mean, that is a very, yeah. it, it sucks in the process, but then after it's done, you kind of, it's like a hard workout. Like you have this good feeling about the fact that you went through that and you're better for it. And then you get to tackle your next objective. And, you know, I think it's interesting that you bring up, um, you know, getting work done and the sprint at the end of the year to make some meaningful progress before 2019 comes around. Because I think that based on the past few episodes we've recorded, there might be some folks listening in that are itching to start a new project and in the form of acquiring a website and starting to grow that in 2019, that might be one of their big goals. I think to date, we've talked about the upside of professional website investing and why it's an attractive asset class. We've talked about some mindset stuff and why you should have a personal mission behind why you're even pursuing website investment as a a branch of entrepreneurship. But today, we're finally going to get around to how you know when you're ready to take the leap, how you know when you're ready to write that check or send that wire transfer to actually acquire your first website and start your journey as a professional website investor. So I know we've got three points to cover today. But before we get into the first one, Ian, is there anything that you want to say generally around this topic? Yeah, well, first of all, we're trying to prepare to help. And so we're going to be launching some additional training uh, around the end of the year so that people can actually say, you know what, I'm going to make a proactive step forward to educate myself and, and uh, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, take the first step. And so uh, looking forward to launching that. I know everybody listening is going to be looking forward to that. I mean, it's always good to have a blueprint or a playbook or a roadmap to get to where you want to be, especially by somebody who has done it before. Um, But I think, you know, we might have, we might open this up with this first green light of what, how you know when you're ready to take the leap by almost shocking folks a little bit with the realism. And, And the first point we want to make is, you know, you're ready to get started when you are personally comfortable with losing 100% of your investment. And if that's a bit jarring to you at home, um, that's kind of by design because the fact of the matter is, if you don't put in the work, this is not a passive income stream, right? This is, you're basically hiring yourself to do a job instead of working for someone else per se. So there is a chance and it might be a very low chance, but your investment could go to zero. And that is different from a lot of other asset classes. It's pretty tough to have a house go to nothing. It's pretty tough to um, have an investment portfolio that goes literally to zero. You might take a bath, you might have a 30, 40, 50% loss, but the chances of you losing all your money are very, very low, almost impossible. Whereas if you acquire a website and you don't put in the work, um, you could find yourself in a pretty stark situation. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts around this, Ian, specifically, and why um, this is a determining factor for when somebody knows if they're ready to make the leap. Yeah, look, um, that might be overstating it just a little bit in the sense that if you buy a seasoned website and you don't do a whole lot to screw it up (laughs) at the get-go, don't change a whole lot at the get-go, you should be able to project going forward that you're going to have some runway to 
come up to speed and and um, you'll see results. Certainly over the intermediate and longer term, you have to do proactively positive things. Um, you know, there's, you know, in the, in the, you know, kind of in the, the ether out there, there's all kinds of stories about people that come in and make massive changes to something that they bought that, you know, had a history and suddenly it goes dark on them and they can't figure out why. You know, I think that's kind of pretty rare. Um, you know, it really depends on the profile of what you're buying. Now, you know, the way that I kind of, um, you know, what, what you articulated is exactly how I couched the first investment that I made to myself. I mean, I was 58 years old and it's really hard, uh, to get your your arms around what you think are all of the moving parts to, um, you know, be able to purchase and then successfully operate um, a, a, a drop shipping website or, you know, any kind of website. And, and so, you know, I essentially, you know, kind of looked myself in the mirror and said, you know, look, dude, you know, as much as you're going to know until you, you know, kind of, you know, jump into the pool. Okay. And, you know, this was after I had put down 30, excuse me, 53 deposits on various websites. And that's with one website broker alone. All right. So, so to say that, that, you know, um, you know, I had certainly had looked at a lot of websites. I had had a lot of uh, back and forth with brokers. I'd done a number of seller uh, uh, conversations to ask the questions. I participated in forums. I bought courses, and yet I still didn't have the confidence to do it. So I basically just had to say, "Look, twenty thousand dollars is going to be my university tuition. You know, university of the internet. So this is going to be my tuition, and um, hope that I don't lose it all, and um, hope that I figure it out. And you know, here we go. And the fact of the matter is, on that website." I called up or I you know sent an email, got my deposit back, and three weeks later I said, you know, you 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 know kind of scaredy you know cat, you you need to take the plunge, go you know, you need to go do this, and that's when I you know shamed I shamed myself literally into to buying the website. So you know twenty thousand dollars wasn't a big deal. I had allocated, and I've talked about this before. I had allocated a you know a fair amount of money. So that I could take, you know, twenty and thirty thousand dollars swings at things, and it wasn't going to kill me. Uh, that website at that time was probably seven or eight years old. So, you know, as I said earlier, you know, if I didn't do a whole lot to screw it up, you know, I thought it would continue for a while, and then we could figure it out. Now, the the the, the takeaway was that a month later we bought, you know, site number two because it was so darn easy, and you know. That, that's that, that's the takeaway. You know, should I have done it sooner? No, I think you do it when you're ready to do it. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things I'd like to unpack there. First, maybe to to save face for myself, I'm not. I didn't mean to paint a doomsday scenario in that. Like, <laughs> if, if this is going to go to zero if you don't nail it, um, I guess it's more similar to the house analogy, where if you buy a house and you don't maintain it over time, it will sure. deteriorate, and eventually nobody yeah, will want to buy it. So. So I think a website, an existing website is much the same way in that, sure, you have a runway and it might, uh, if you do nothing at all, it's probably going to taper off and over a period of one, five, 10 years, whatever it takes, eventually it could go to zero. So the point here that I was trying to make is you do have to add energy and add value to it in order to sustain and grow it. So that's something that's important to know going in, which is something that I just wanted to clarify uh, for myself secondarily. Well, yeah, but, but don't, don't, don't beat yourself up because unless... You are facile at due diligence, mm -hmm. and you you actually understand, you know, you know, kind of, you know, what the, you know, what is, you know, uh, delivering the value in the website. Mm -hmm. You could very easily, you know, buy somebody's bill of goods and website brokers. I'm not saying they're scurrilous, but they will sell you a website if you you know, decide that you want to put up the money and it may, you know, it may not be all that it's cracked up to. Look, I, I, I monitor 
lots of things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I can I can give you example after example of of listings and various brokers websites that have imploded after they've been listed. So, you know, yes, you know, it could go to zero. Don't 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 discount that. Right. Um, it, it is what it is. You know, there's a reason somebody's selling. You know, they might know more than you do, right? Yeah. So, matter of fact, like you know, we just had one uh, situation like that. You know, a couple months ago. One that we were uh, a partner and I were looking at, and you know, lo and behold, you know, the 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 uh, the, the main engine of uh, the the platform that they were doing business with, uh, you know, they're 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 you know, essentially you know, kind of uh, they you know, lost their their uh, sales volume, and you know, <laughs> now they have lovely stuff, but they have nobody to sell it to. Yeah, due diligence is always important on the front end. And then you're going to have to take personal responsibility and accountability on the back end to make sure that this thing can stand the long haul. The other interesting point I heard you mention earlier uh, is what I would refer to as analysis paralysis, right? Like we, we don't, we're hesitant to take action. We're hesitant to push our chips in, write a check, whatever. So we just do more research and that makes us feel good. That makes us feel like we are making progress. But if you get to a point, I mean, I don't know a single surgeon that has learned and been qualified to be a surgeon purely by reading textbooks or sitting in a classroom. Like you have to get in and do, right? And if you find yourself um, taking in case studies or prospectus or articles or listening to interviews, even like this, and you can almost write the interview for them, you know enough, you know enough. The next thing you need to do is get your hands dirty and start executing because the only way that you're gonna continue to learn and see results is to get in there and get in the game, get off the sidelines and get in the game. So I'm curious to hear your reaction to that point. Well, I think the other natural thing is that, you know, in your surgeon analogy is, is pretty funny because, you know, there are umpteen different, you know, business models. And so you can be, you know, kind of, you know, diving very deep into one business model. And then suddenly, you know, you get distracted and you go start to look at, you know, the next shiny thing that comes across your, your inbox in an entirely different business model. And you ended up making, you know, no progress. So that's like the surgeon who sudden, suddenly starts to read about dentistry or something. I mean, you know, it's of no value to the progress that, that he makes as a surgeon to be looking over at some, you know, totally unrelated, um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, um, uh, monetization model. So you got to figure out, you know, what it is that you're going to go after and then get as deep as you possibly can. But your point's well taken. You know, until you, you know, step up at the plate and take a swing at some balls, um, you know, you're, 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 you're not going to make much progress. I mean, people ask me about the math behind it. And I think the math, I don't, you know, I don't know who came up with this rule of thumb, but I agree with it. I think that once you kind of, you know, um, determine exactly what fair way you're going to play on, what monetization model you're going to look on, uh, uh, look at. You're going to look at 100 deals, 10 of those deals are going to kind of fit, and you're going to be interested in them, and you're going to want to, to uh, engage on them. And three of those, you might actually enter into negotiations on and see if you can you know, get a really good deal you know, on one of those. And I think so it's 110 to three. And that's after you've kind of figured out exactly what the monetization model is. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time doing research, and that's what's going to get you comfortable. Yep. Yep. Um, I, you know, I think the last point that I want to cover here under this first green light about being comfortable with the level of risk and possibly losing 100% of your investment is uh, maybe quantifying exactly what that level of investment is. Now, you said your first acquisition was about $20,000, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. That was a figure that you were comfortable with possibly losing at the time. Would you say that point of entry is still um, the most common or most preferred level to get involved today in 2018? Or if somebody has a lower budget, would you encourage them to wait? Would you encourage them to buy just a lower price site? Like, what, What's your guidance there? No, I, I think, you know, the, the uh, I, look, uh, first of all, I, I, I've referred to my original philosophy as the venture capital philosophy, right? So, so putting some small bets out there on a number of, uh, on a number of uh, sites and, and seeing what works and then put more money behind those things that work 
as a way to get an education and get some confidence and then pursue things that are, you know, much larger where you put, you know, lots of chips on the table because you now have spent that mythical thousand days and become a, you know, uh, an, an expert of sorts. Okay. And, and, um, you know, that thousand day rule comes from the guys over at Tropical MBA. They had a long discussion on, on that. So, so the, the, you know, the original philosophy was the, you know, kind of the, the venture capital, um, uh, 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 method of investing, you know, some of them you're going to lose all your money on the bulk of them. You're going to do m- not much and maybe one or two are going to be home runs. That's been our, that's been our, our experience. You know, we've had one home run. It's done, you know, incredibly well. We have another one incubating right now. That's going to be a very solid performer. Um, you know, cross your fingers in six months that we're talking about a sale process for that maybe, or, or, or adding to it. I don't know. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, a few in the middle and then there's some ones that were smaller and the reason that, that, you know, never got traction. And I think, you know, one of the problems with smaller sites is that, you know, if you're a busy executive, uh, uh, you know, you're just not going to learn much from, you know, buying, you know, sub $10,000 sites, to be honest with you. I mean, you need to, you know, kind of, kind of get into the game with some, some, you know, real money to see if it, you know, um, you know, you know, what it's like to really, you know, kind of, um, have your hands on the levers. Now, don't take all of your 401k, cash it out, all of your, sell your car and put it all in, you know, one, one idea. Don't do that. You know, um, I know someone that did and it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, that's a big, that's a big risk. I, I don't, you know, espouse that. I think that, you know, um, you know, to, to try to figure out how you can, you know, get some exposure where you feel very comfortable. That's got enough scale that you're in the game. Um, but that you have, you know, the ability to buy a couple of more sites or four or five more sites. Um, you know, I was lucky enough that I had a, a an opportunity to buy a twenty thousand dollars site, but I was willing to go up to thirty five or forty thousand dollars to make sure that I got a site that had some history. That had some, uh, you know, some consistency, and where I could really feel like I, you know, was operating a site with all of the facets that, you know, that, um, uh, you know, that I would need to understand if I were going to, you know, you know, uh, you know, go bigger and and you know in, make increasingly large bets. Yeah. So I guess maybe the the point to take home there is that um, if you're itching to get started, but you don't have the capital to make three to five bets at a certain level, whether that's 5,000 per site, 10,000 per site. If you, if you only have enough for one, maybe you're not quite ready. And maybe it's continue at the day job, um, you know, explore some other avenues of entrepreneurship, save up that nest egg, and then be ready to make multiple bets over the long term to kind of diversify and protect yourself a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I, I would say, you know, you, you know, there are plenty of people that can that that uh, you know m- you know maybe have you know more tech savvy than 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 I had at fifty eight, and you know it, it would be very reasonable for them to be able to buy a, a, a you know a fairly decent sized site that has a history, and you know they'd be very comfortable doing it. Um, be you know be delighted to talk to anyone to help them you know make that uh, decision. Is kind of what I do you know, on the website when people email me. So Ian Bonded Professional Website Investors, if you're going through that you know, kind of uh, that, that quandary right now. Yeah, that's a very generous offer. I encourage anybody that's interested to take Ian up on that one. Um, you know, maybe that leads us into our, our second point here, the second factor that lets you know that you're ready to make the leap. And I think, you know, once you have accepted the risk and you're willing to accept that worst case scenario of losing your investment, um, the next thing that you want to look for is the, your ability to clearly and distinctly describe in detail why a particular opportunity is attractive to you and why you think it's um, prone to success, why it differentiates itself in the market. So assuming that's the case and you're able to do that, what are some of the factors that a prospective website investor should be able to um, have some discourse around and, and some analysis around as points of differentiation to give them the confidence like, okay, this is a site I actually want to move forward with? So, so I have, uh, 
I have experimented with some different philosophies and some have worked out and some have been horrible busts. And, um, you know, that's how I roll. Okay. So um, let me tell you about a couple that went horribly wrong. Okay. I became enamored with a site that, uh, you know, went back to the late 1990s, had a ton of history, was in the, 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 you know, kind of the wedding party favors uh, or uh, wedding party, you know, niche where supplied 30, 40, $50 items that people would use at wedding parties. And, you know, lo and behold, I can tell you that it was uh, a dead, a, a disaster because although the percentage margins were rich, the dollar margins were horrible. And it's dollars that you got to pay Google with. And when you don't have strong brand affiliations, um, you're going you're gonna to struggle to advertise, you know, lots of crummy little products. And so, you know, the length of the tenure of that website helped a lot in terms of organic reach, but slowly, you know, uh, the world has changed and you know, now a lot of people are buying things in, you know, uh, at, on Etsy and other places. And, you know, that, that didn't work out at all. It was a horrible purchase. On the other hand, you know, um, the second website we bought, which is probably something today I wouldn't look at, and I'll come back to that in a second. The, the major thing that intrigued me about this is it's an incredibly large niche and I thought that that it, if it worked, um, and that's a that was an if. If it worked, we could scale it, and and it could get to you know something that you know is like what it is today. And I thought that was a remote possibility. Okay, I thought it might just be a decent earner, but because it's such a large niche, I thought that it had the opportunity to scale. And we got incredibly lucky doing that. Okay. I think that to be, um, and, and I think that, I think that that's still a valid, um, investment criteria looking for things where you can scale. Okay. So, you know, what can you, what can you do, uh, in a very large niche to, um, you know, uh, compete and, you know, right now with the minimum wage going up in the United States, um, using a global outsourced labor pool, you've got an incredible cost advantage against a lot of people that are based in the United States. And so that cost advantage is something that that fractional cost advantage can be huge for you. So I think that's an opportunity. But I really think that the, the biggest opportunity is to look for niches where you can establish yourself as a trusted authority providing information and advice to people looking in these little niches and um, you know where there's not a lot of competition and where you focus a lot on uh, ways to optimize through search engine optimization and through relationships with um, you know suppliers who aren't dealing with Tons of online retailers. I, the you know to me that to me that that's almost a formula that works. Uh, you know, I'll call it a formula. I think it's a formula that works uh, in in today's world. So maybe the advice we're really giving here is it's easy to fall into the trap of just looking at the quantitative stuff, especially if you're going through a broker. They'll have site traffic and revenue yeah. and conversion rates and whatever else they might have on there. Um, that's part of it, but don't lose sight of the qualitative aspect. Some of the relationships with existing suppliers, brand recognition, size of the market, you know, potential for growth, um, competitors, and things like that. You, you want to look at, you want to balance both of those. And it's it's easy, like you said, to get enamored with a site that is in a niche that attracts you, but might not have great financials or something like that. So I think maybe the point here is um, document the stuff, put it all on paper, try to look at it as objectively as you can. And in the absence of that. Um, you know, maybe even seek out a coach, a mentor, or a community like professional website investors 
to go say, hey, I'm thinking about this opportunity here. Here's kind of my anonymized um, assessment of the site, you know, take the URL off or whatever, so somebody doesn't buy it out from under you. Let's say, uh, can anybody like fact check me here? Can anybody give me a reality check and make sure that I don't have rose colored glasses on in assessing this thing? Does this look like a good, good opportunity to you? as uh, it does to me. So would you be in agreement, I guess, with that approach? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, the more uh, eyes that you can have on something, um, you know, the, the, the better. I mean, you know, uh, there's just, there's, you know, I kind of have a mental knockout list when I see a thing, you know, when I see, you know, listings and I li- literally just go through and I say, you know, that, you know, this doesn't fit for this reason. I'm not even going to look any further. So, you know, um, but you know, look, there's, there's, you know, uh, you know, is what you're looking at seasonal? Is that something that you want to be involved in? I, I don't want to be involved in something that's seasonal. Um, what do the Google Trends look like? I mean, is this a, is this a market that's on? Is this something that's, you know, kind of on the upswing? You know, who are the competitors that you're going to be, you know, kind of uh, competing with in uh, Google product listing ads? Um, there's, there's a, you know, um, uh, you know, who, you know, what are the, uh, you know, what is the the, the number of suppliers look like and how many people are they, you know, kind of onboarding as, as retailers to compete against you. There's, there's a, you know, ton of different metrics that you need to look at. And there might be a couple that don't, don't fit perfectly and, and it could, and it could work. Um, there's, you know, like I say, you know, there's a, but there is a mental knockout list. And I think that if you, you know, kind of believe philosophically what I articulated, that there's this magic formula where you look for, Niches where you can become a trusted authority, um, and there are ways to to to, to do that. And you're going to look at a lot of different niches and a lot of different sites, but when you find one, you're able to develop it, um, and you know you just put the put the um, you know kind of uh, uh, t- tried and tested um, uh, um, uh, you know different. Uh, uh, regiments in the into the what you're we're doing with the website, and you know over time that will work out well. So you know that's the way I I think about it. When you use the example earlier of taking a venture capital approach to having a portfolio of sites and making a handful of bets to kind of spread the risk across the portfolio and hoping that you have one unicorn and a few of pretty uh, decent you know hit a couple of doubles and triples and then you have some singles that kind of flare out. Um, I think if you do some research into venture capital firms, they all have this investment thesis, right? And I think that ev- as you acquire additional websites, you'll kind of suss out your personal investment thesis and you'll say, hey, I don't, I don't play in home goods. I don't know that space. I'm not very good at it. So any site that's a home goods industry, I'm not interested or pet products or whatever it ends up being. And over time, you'll get these criteria. And instead of trying to collect good opportunities, you will actively be filtering out bad opportunities. So the only things left are things that you know that you can be successful with. So I think our point here is like, this is the green light for acquiring your first site, but over time you'll get better and better at this and you'll be able to make decisions uh, more quickly and more confidently. So, um, you know, I think that that is a, the transition into the last point we want to cover today, which is like, okay, you, you have accepted the level of risk. You're um, okay with the possible negative outcome. You have built a case study, a business case for yourself for why a specific site is an attractive option. And finally, um, you know you're ready to jump in when you have a solid plan for handling some of the core business functions. So maybe we'll start with what are the handful of areas that you need to have a plan for, and then we can talk about the different types of plans you might have. All right, well, so, so the, 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 the core activities, or what I call the activity chain for any monetization model is every monetization model is gonna be unique, okay? So, so you need to sit down and think about what that activity chain is. In physical goods, there are essentially three core activities that you've got to think about how you're going to excel and how you're going to end up, um, uh, you know, uh, handling uh, these activities. Well, the first is, you know, kind of the sourcing and supply. So you're going to have supplier arrangements. Secondly, you're going to have website operations. Everything is sold through a website, so you're going to need to operate the website. That's everything from, you know, um, you know, having a payment processor and good relationships with them to uploading products to making sure that your inventory is in sync. And the third piece is the customer service piece. Now, when I was looking at, you know, where I wanted to participate, the reason that I chose 
physical goods e-commerce, specifically drop shipping, was that I thought that that activity chain, as I think of it, worked well for my skill set. I can easily deal with suppliers. Um, the website operations, um, I became increasingly confident that using the Shopify platform or the big commerce platform, we could handle that. And the thing I was probably most confident on was the customer service piece because I managed people before. And so, you know, uh, thinking larger, you know, you know, we, we, we planned to have a customer service staff. And, and so, you know, we, we thought about that. Now, the other things that, you know, kind of are common to, to, um, you know, kind of all monetization models are things like, you know, kind of the, 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 um, the, you know, kind of legal structures, the accounting and finance structures, which, uh, 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 or excuse me, systems, which are, are so important. You, 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 uh, you know, obviously have to have, you know, the correct legal setup and you have to have, you know, kind of a financial reporting setup that, you know, allows you to operate. Um, you know, when you look at different monetization models, one of the things that you're going to come to grips with pretty quickly is what are the capital requirements to participate? You know, so one of the you know, wonderful things about uh, drop shipping is that it's not capital intensive, it's not inventory intensive, so it's not capital intensive. The bad news is that the margins are substantially less than in other physical goods model. So those are the main, uh, the, the, I think that's the framework to think about it. What's the activity chain? Then how do you handle these other couple of things that you, that, you know, um, you know, it should be fairly easy for you to put in place. You know, your legal structure is an LLC. Um, that's your, you know, how you're going to do your, your, your bank account. You only need one LLC. And the, the um, accounting and finance, you know, we've spent a lot of time developing, um, you know, kind of, um, I don't want to call them cheat sheets, but spreadsheets that are, you know, uh, in, incredibly descriptive that help us stay on it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, you know, we have, you know, kind of um, integrated into our, uh, uh, you know, everything we do, uh, the zero accounting system. So we not only keep track of, you know, kind of our, um, our daily and monthly order flow on spreadsheets, but we also, you know, kind of sync everything and make sure it, it foots with our bank balances and making sure that we're getting everything right. So, um, you know, you have, you have to have those kinds of things in place. Well, there's some important considerations and potential trade-offs there because for all of those functions, you may be inclined to take all of that on yourself, um, which is fine if you have the skills to do that, but not everybody's strengths and weaknesses are so diverse that they can handle right. operations, customer support, legal, financial. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty special person. You're an all-star if you can do all that. So you're either going to sacrifice quality for those things, or you're going to have to move a lot slower because you're going to have to learn a little bit about each bucket and you're going to have to dedicate. So you're limited by the time that you have available. Uh, the alternative would be to hire or outsource some of those functions to a service or an individual. And in that case, you have to think about that in the scope of the total acquisition cost of the site. So you have acquisition cost and then operating costs. Um, that, that's going to drive those numbers up. So that's something to think about and a trade-off that you're going to have to consider. Um, but if you find yourself in a position where you have a plan for that, and it's a plan that you think is fiscally viable, then I think that is what we're saying is the green light for you to go ahead and make the leap and, and take your first step into becoming a website investor and acquiring that first site. Yeah, I, I mean, I think first, first of all, point well taken, you will never see in a broker's listing any allocation for these administrative uh, types of requirements that you have. No one says, you know, no one allocates to, you know, accounting and, and uh, uh, legal expenses when they're selling you a website, that's on you. Um, matter of fact, the greatest lie in website brokerage business is when, you know, the sellers tell you how many hours a week they spend in the business. Oh, you know, I spend two hours a week. The biggest lie, and I'm going to call people, I thought, you know, I've often thought I'm going to get on a soapbox and literally use this as a platform to call people out on some of their listings. But I think that that might earn me, you know, way too, <laughs> way too many enemies. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's patently false what you see advertised as the amount of time sellers spend on their 
websites in the brokers listings, you know, think, you know, longer and harder about it. And to the extent that they do only spend that, then they're spending a fortune that they're not showing on outsourced help. So, you know, you're right. You're going to have to, you're going to have to account for having, you know, a specialist people, a specialist help you, which we're a huge proponent of and which we use, as you know, in literally everything we do. So. Yeah, so that that sticker price that you might see on the broker site is not the total investment cost, which is something to be aware of. And maybe to to balance that out, uh, at the same time, if you do find yourself eventually having two, three, four sites or more, some of these costs can be spread across the entire portfolio, and you're not paying the exact same amount. Like you can keep an attorney on retainer, and they can service your whole portfolio for a flat rate, and that cost isn't multiplied necessarily by the number of sites. Uh, that's not true for all services, but um, if you're thinking that this is a large upfront investment. If you're, you're serious about this and you do make a career out of it and you have multiple sites, then some of these costs can be spread across your entire portfolio. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you that one of the, the things that I um, see people struggle with, and and you know, you you literally, they, I think that they literally fail if they aren't committed to outsourcing and getting that that leverage on their time from the beginning, and and. and um, you know, I, I, I help people who just can't seem to, to, to get there to outsource and put in procedures and standard operating uh, policies uh, to run things so that they can, you know, be more strategic and, you know, kind of be the chairman and CEO as opposed to the worker bee. So, you know, it's absolutely um, a necessity to be, to be honest with you. And I think that if you don't have that that uh, that mindset, you know, you're you're really at risk of you know failing in your very first venture. Um, to your point of spreading it over multiple um, sites, it's absolutely the case that this is a uh, business of scale, and that's you know one of the things that excited me about this opportunity. Um, the bigger you get. The easier it is to defray all those 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 costs, uh, everything from the software you're using to the people and the training of the people, which is really your your lifeblood. I mean, there's lots of lifebloods to your business, but your people are your lifeblood. Your suppliers are your lifeblood. You know, uh, getting leverage on 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 these things is you know is is incredibly important um, because. You know, the, the, the margins in the business, you know, are largely determined, you know, away from you. Um, you know, you have to be competitive in the marketplace. And so kind of the, 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 the way to earn more money is to scale your administrative costs and be as frugal as you can with, you know, kind of um, um, how you support the business that you support. And, you know, look, the most expensive money is the money is the money that you personally spend in the business i mean it doesn't show up oftentimes in the bank account but you know if you're going to spend 20 hours a week on a website that earns $800 a month or something you know that's you know pretty darn expensive relative to 20 hours a week on a website that earns 5000 a month think of you know you have to think of it in those terms yeah. And, you know, I think we use this as a bookend because it is such an important conversation to have with yourself. And if you have a team, you know, to have a conversation with your team before you acquire the site. Um, it's definitely something that we are going to go deeper into in a future episode about building a team and scaling out your processes and leveraging your time and things like that. So, um, but I think for today, we're going to leave it at the three green lights that we discussed, which are basically, um, you know, you're ready to make the leap when you have accepted the potential risk of losing your 100% of your investment, as unlikely as that may be, um, you do need to come to grips with the fact that that is a possible outcome. Uh, you do need to be able to describe in detail why a particular opportunity is attractive and how it's differentiated from other players in the space. And then finally, you have to have some kind of a plan for handling those handful of core business functions that we just covered. So those are three prerequisites. If you check those three boxes, I think you have Ian and I's seal of approval to go forward and do good and uh, start your professional website uh, investing journey. So, Ian, unless you have any parting words here, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, but I'll no, I would, I, 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 you know, I would just say that even if you have that, I'd love to, I'd love to challenge you. So, you know, Ian Bond and professional website investors, I would be more than happy to 
to challenge you on your convictions to, uh, you know, if you're kind of in this world, we spend a lot of time in our own head. And if mm-hmm. you're spending a lot of time in your own heads and you think you've got it perfect, please seek outside advice. <laughs> Yeah, it never hurts to get a second opinion uh, in health, in life, or in business, especially. So um, thank you for that, Ian, and thank you for your time today. We'll look forward to the next episode of the show. Thanks, James. It's great to see you and look forward to seeing you again. Same to you. Take care. Yeah, care. All right, folks. So there you have it. That wraps up my conversation with Ian Bond, who shared a ton of valuable insights and advice for how to know when you're ready to take the plunge into website investing. So let's quickly recap the three green lights that we talked about today. The three ways, the three flags that you can see on the horizon that indicate that you're ready to make that jump and invest in your first website soon or in the near future. The first is that you are comfortable losing 100% of your investment. We talked about how this can be a scary feeling, but most of these website investments have a relatively low chance of going all the way to zero. The odds that you're going to lose 100% of your money are very low, very slim, but it is a possibility and it is something that you're going to have to come to grips with if you're going to take the first step to becoming a professional website investor. The second green light that we talked about was the ability to describe in detail why a particular site or opportunity is differentiated in the market, why it's an attractive opportunity compared to the alternatives, and what your plan is for acquiring that site and growing it in Uh, relation to the other competitors that might exist in the market. And finally, we talked about having a solid plan for handling the core business functions. Things like operations, customer support, legal requirements, finances, sales, marketing, and growth. You may think that you can do all of those on your own, but the fact of the matter is that very few people have a skill set that is so diverse that they can do an A-plus job in each of those areas. So you're going to have to have a plan for outsourcing those, automating those, hiring on help. Basically, you need to have a playbook that takes you from step zero to a world where you have all of these things accounted for in one way or another, and you can focus on growing and scaling the business or making your next investment. So those three green lights together, if you can check the box in all three of those areas, we suggest that you are ready to take the first step and become a professional website investor. During our conversation today, we shared a lot of tools and resources. We'll link all of those up in the show notes, and those will be available at professionalwebsiteinvestors.com. As always, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. You learned something along the way. And if you haven't already, that you consider subscribing to the show, sharing it with a friend or family member, or leaving us a review in your favorite podcast directory. It really is the best way to support our work and to support the show and get it out there to even more people so that we can help others become professional website investors just like you are doing by listening to the show today. So until next time, best of luck in everything that you do. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Professional Website Investors Podcast.